Dear Institute of Sunday Think Tank listeners, today it's my great pleasure and honor to host Mr. Balint Lashlotu, who serves as a researcher at the Matthias Corvinius Collegium and is affiliated with the University of Budapest, the Corvinius University of Budapest, and he will soon uh, complete his PhD, um, which will be definitely published by one of the best publishing houses in Europe, I, I hope. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, yeah. Uh, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Piotr. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for all the job and experiences we, we have done together in these years, since I joined your project in Staten Assembly in 2019. That's right. We had the chance to work together on uh, many publications, we published papers and um, and reviews together, and it was an amazing job. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input in my projects, and I hope to contribute to your projects as well. So uh, we meet in Budapest, Hungary, just after the incredible conference which was organized by Matthias Corvinius Collegium and Balint himself yesterday. It was an amazing event, and uh, you can check the websites of the uh, Collegium um, and uh, surely uh, this is something which uh, which brings us together in the region because uh, Balin specializes in the Visegrad group, Western Balkan affairs uh, as, as well as global migration issues. Uh, his uh, university activities include world economics and European economic governance and public policy design in Central and Eastern Europe. He's a great fan of the Central Europe. Indeed. And he sees it as a region with plenty of opportunities. So my first question to you is about you and your research. Tell me more about Europe in Saturn Ascendant. What inspires you to do this research? What allows you to look into the field of international relations with the passion and perseverance and such an enthusiasm. Well, thank you very much for this question because it's a it's a very interesting one. Um, you know, the the main passion for me is actually to disseminate knowledge about our region in other parts of the world. Therefore. In my researches and in my publications, I am concentrating on English language papers, articles to write about our region in English so that people living in other countries, in other parts of the world can know more about Central Eastern Europe or East Central Europe. Because, uh, you know, as just like as everyone else in the world, we are living in our own bubble, mm -hmm. in our own personal universe. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a Polish universe, there is a Hungarian universe, there is a Czech and Slovak, and it goes on and on. But for other people, this region is uh, incredibly unknown. If you go to the US and mention uh, Central Europe, Maybe they will, would know about Prague, or Krakow, or Budapest, or Vienna. But they don't really know about the history of these places, about the culture, and about the differences. Because we have, of course, many things in common, but also many things that separates us. And this diversity is, is one of the most interesting things, I think, because for a thousand years or for more than a thousand years we are here our nations are here and uh, it's incredible that of course we had we fought some battles in the middle ages but predominantly we were always on the same side fighting against even bigger threats from the east or from the south and sometimes from the west as well and this is our location is incredibly unique in the heart of Europe. Strice Europe, as they say in, in Czech language. Uh, 
because we connect our region, this East Central European region connects east to the west and south to the north. And it gives us a huge potential, but also huge responsibility. And it caused many, many uh, bloodsheds and tearful periods in history. Because this is the region where empires collide every now and then. That's why I'm saying that this gives us a huge responsibility. Another uh, aspect of uh, my motivation is that, uh, of course, there are many, many interesting parts of the world I would like to know more about and research more about in, more in detail, like uh, China, Japan, the Gulf countries, you name it. But as a native Hungarian who was born in, in the centralist Europe, who even by religion uh, is very, con very much connected to this region, to a sub-region in centralist Europe because I'm Greek Catholic, which is a very interesting uh, church connecting the Orthodox Church to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I think that as a researcher, I really, really have to use this knowledge that only a native can use. And uh, this gives um, me, I don't know, more insight or more background to the field. And when I worked for a multinational company, a corporation, I had many, many colleagues from abroad, actually most of my colleagues from all over the world, from Brazil to Vladivostok, you know, everywhere. And I really enjoyed showing them around in Hungary and in Central East Europe. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, to give them insights about our politics, about our culture, because uh, I realized that they don't really know much about these countries, these nations. So that was the, the main reason I chose our region, even if uh, my foreign language skills would not predict this uh, uh, field of expertise because uh, I speak besides English, Italian and Spanish and uh, a little bit of Turkish. So, but still, I, I always I am keen on learning more about our region and one of my plans in future, once I'm done with my current stuff, is to learn a, a Slavic language from our region, possibly Polish or I don't know what else. Uh, because uh, I think it's, it's, it's always good to know more about each other. And uh, I will work on it because it's not just to conclude this um, answer. The case is not that the Western countries or Western European countries or Eastern European countries know uh, little about our region, but our, we ourselves, we don't know our neighbors as much as we could. Uh, there used to be many um, areas of interaction between the Poles and the Hungarians in the um, era of the socialism, but they don't exist anymore. And those connections uh, are slowly but surely dying out as those generations are slowly disappearing. So that's what I would like to emphasize, and this is my aim, to find those ties that bind us together and work on it to make it stronger. Thank you much for this comprehensive response. And I need to say that uh, I wish you all the best with the idea of learning Polish. I cannot commit to learning Hungarian because, from my perspective, it is too difficult to, to comprehend the beautiful Hungarian language. But I would love to know more about Hungary, for sure, and Hungarian politics. And elaborating on what you said, 
how do you bring this passion to your work as a researcher at MCC? Actually, I'm quite lucky because the sub-entity I'm work, working for, the School for Social Sciences and History. Uh, so it used, it used to be called the School for, or the Center for Centuries Europe, originally. That's why we have a special focus on our region. And our students, they are really interested in this region. So now I can, uh, actually, I, I've been given full liberty, full freedom on what uh, courses to launch, what lectures to take and to give, and uh, even in the format. So, for instance, I'm really enjoying breaking the pre preliminary ideas, premises, and preconceptions in the minds of our students. You know, they are in the age of 20, around 2022, 20, young and very talented people with the hunger for knowledge. And when uh, I bring them to the Balkans, I realize that they have, they are full of with uh, preliminary conceptions about Balkanic states. And once we are there, they realize that all they knew about those nations, those states, and their history has to be reshaped because what they see themselves in situ on, on the ground is, is very different from their preconceptions. I give you some examples. When we went to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Sarajevo in, uh, just before their uh, parliamentary elections in, in last o October, uh, our students uh, did not really know that uh, what is the um, bloody heritage of the Balkanic War and how it still lives together, lives on with the current uh, young generations too. And uh, how different cultures and I should say civilizations can live together in one city, Sarajevo, let's say. But the same with Bulgaria. Uh, Sofia is a beautiful city. It's a clean city and it's, uh, it has uh, beautiful buildings, beautiful surroundings. And uh, still, our parents and grandparents used to visit Bulgaria in their, I don't know, scholarships or doing their vacations or holidays. But we, our generations and the younger generations, they tend to go to, to Italy, to, to France instead, while Bulgaria has remained as interesting as it used to be. So yeah, that's what I really enjoy. And uh, how can I bring those things, my interests and, and my field of expertise to my lessons and to my, to my research? Uh, actually, I can combine because I have, uh, I think as every one of us who are working and dealing with social sciences, we have a huge affection and, in, and interest in uh, interest for uh, history. So for instance, I launched a a walking course in Budapest. It's called the Social Geography of Budapest. And uh, each occasion we visit uh, another uh, section of the city. We have a one and a half hour walk and uh, we go through the history of that zone of the city. Um, we address many interesting things about uh, the regime changes. You know, the 20th century was full of regime changes in our region. I think uh, in every every second decade uh, there was a, a new regime in Budapest, political regime, and they really enjoy to explore the city they live in. To and after these lessons, after these courses, they will walk by the streets of Budapest with a different eye because they will think, ah, yeah, that statue was removed by this and that regime or destroyed 
but that new regime again brought this statue, rebuilt it. That street was it used to be called this and that, but after the regime change, they renamed it or they gave the, its original name back. Just a, a short example. Uh, we have a huge square, a very important intersection in the Buddha side of Budapest. It used to be called for many, many decades in the 20th century, Moskva Square. Mm -hmm. Moscow Square in English, Moskva Theater. There is even a movie with this title, a generational movie. But a few years ago, 10 years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, uh, they renamed it and they named it after one of our first prime ministers in the dualism era of Austria, Austria Hungary. And you know, the younger generations did not understand why, why to name this. Moscow Square, because everyone knew it, it was uh, kind of part of the popular culture, a meeting point for young people. But then, when you talk about the history of that place, you realize that, uh huh, this square was originally called mm -hmm. and named after that politician and the Soviet regime, the Communist Party renamed it. Mm -hmm. And now they have a different view and different perspective on that. And that's what I, I truly enjoy in my field. I think that when it comes to Poland, Bulgaria, and Hungary, we have similar experiences in this field. Renaming the names of the street is a new way, and I think it will continue because of the very, um, let's say, um, interesting political climate in our countries, let's say. Um, can you tell me more about your research at the university? What do you do? How do you find the experience? Of, because you are ending your uh, PhD, or you are still affiliated, of course. But tell me more about the university. And you in this university, of course. Yeah, sure. I, I am lucky enough to be able to combine uh, my former work, performer job, and my research. Uh, I used to be affiliated with the Hungarian State Railways as an international relations expert there. And uh, that's why my PhD research, which was and which is on uh, public policy cooperation among V4 states, I had the chance to use this case study of railway cooperation, and it was the best choice for me suggested by my supervisor. Because uh, this way, I could use my knowledge and the practical knowledge, the daily knowledge I gathered at my former workplace, my personal relationship connections and this area of expertise which is uh, a bonus if i may say it's a, it's an extra thing in uh, in the academic research so for instance when i am talking about the overlapping institutional memberships international memberships of uh, um, let's say the state-owned uh, railway undertakings in our region. I can give examples to that, real-life examples. I can uh, um, give and add um, real-life examples to the premises of the school of thought of the, um, let's say, the those those IR schools that are dealing with the uh, spillover effects of the European Union uh, cohesion politics in our region. So that's that's something which is um, which is an extra thing I can use. And in my lessons, in the lectures I give, the students really enjoy those examples I can. I can bring 
to the table from my personal uh, experiences because uh, railway transport is something that it's it's a part of our everyday life and you don't really think about the policy shaping attributes of of uh, transport infrastructure but there is such a thing just think of the those wild west movies mm -hmm. from the 60s and 70s in every in each western uh, movie there is a section there is a bit when people are building railways mm -hmm. and the railways connect settlements and those settlements with railway station become huge cities and the same happened in uh, Siberia in the same time or in Australia so railway building infrastructure building is nation building and it's still it is now uh, today now in our region uh, due to our uh, climate goals sustainability goals railway has been given a special attention in the uh, European Union policy making and uh, now we are thinking of building up high speed connections in our region obviously the covid pandemic the inflation and uh, this war in ukraine is a burden and it, it halted those initiatives but uh, there is still a huge need for that because in uh, in our region it's unnecessary to um, fly from Budapest uh, by airplane to Prague when when you can do the same thing on a train or in your car and uh, in a door-to-door -door format. So yeah, that, that's the thing. What I what I really enjoy in uh, in my university researches. And uh, the other thing is that I had the chance I had the chance to attend international conferences, academic conferences which are very good lessons to, to learn, to bring, new, bring your ideas to a broader audience, to get feedback, and then to socialize, to have informal chats in the coffee breaks with more experienced researchers, and uh, to build up relationship, relationships and to work together on, on projects and to publish together. In your writings, you very often say that the infrastructure Railway infrastructure in our four countries, which about countries, is not fully integrated, and that prevents us from introducing such projects like high-speed railway in our countries. From your perspective, how to overcome it? How can we, except for obviously the investment which could be gathered from four countries, like we can all chip in and build the network which we need, but can we attract the funding from outside? Like, for instance, one belt, one road initiative, and before the war, Ukraine, of course, uh, could have helped the region to build this uh, necessary uh, artery of our communication, or, in your opinion, we shouldn't rely on the outside factors, we could just bring our resources together and bring the project on the fast track, basically. Unfortunately, our region is still lacking the necessary resources, financial resources and working capital to do such huge investments. That's why primarily we hugely rely on European Union funds, especially cohesion funds and those different packages, special specialized packages of the cohesion fund like the Connecting Europe facility, shift to rail, uh, joint undertaking and stuff like that. Belt and Road Initiative is a very useful thing and uh, but it's a actually it's a it's a sword with two blades how we put it so uh, it's um, it can be a useful tool, but it can be dangerous as well. Just think of uh, Montenegro and the state that 
Macedonia, Ethiopia, uh, London. Yes, ended exactly. up with the, with the trap of not being able to play on the investment. And now that we uh, we are experiencing a, uh, an era, unfortunately, of uh, armed conflicts, mm -hmm. security issues also prevail. And you, especially if you you're a Polish, you tend to see everything through the lens of the national defense and security policy, with a reason. And uh, that's why I'm saying that Baton Road initiative had many uh, positive sides, especially in the Balkans, to bring the necessary resources there. But it had to be all, all the time compensated with other resources. Take the example of uh, Serbia. Mm -hmm. Serbia uses its uh, relationship with China, uses uh, Chinese funds, knowledge, and uh, engineering to build up new uh, transport infrastructures, motorways, railway infrastructures. But it also uses its relationship with Turkey and uh, its relationship with Russia and with the European Union. Everything together, and I think this diversification. We have to uh, follow this example to diversify this portfolio portfolios of MTI attraction in this field. And uh, of course, this uh, three C's initiative is to be seen as an alternative to the Chinese presence in. Uh, region in terms of uh, investments, infrastructural investments. And it's good because uh, for us as customers, those who pay to have uh, uh, a broader spectrum of opportunities of choices, it's always best because we can offer the best solution. We have the chance to choose, which is important, but I primarily uh, source of funding is the European Union. It's a natural source of funding because we contribute as member states to the communitarian budget. And we are entitled, entitled to such funds. Mm -hmm. And it is the job of our politicians, um, lobby organizations, and all this stuff to, to get the necessary funding. And for instance, this uh, cooperation among uh, those EU member states that uh, joined the European Union in or after 2004, this Friends of Cohesion Club, or even um, the V4 cooperation within the European Union was quite successful in uh, combining our resources and uh, joining our efforts to gain better positions when it came to negotiations on communitarian funds uh, in the European Union. So this is the way. You mentioned the uh, different uh, technological parameters that separates us. Actually, there are two uh, approaches to overcome such challenge. One is, there is always one group which says it's always best to use our existing infrastructure to modernize it. Small steps. Yeah. And yes, and to, to go step by step. And there is another group which says that, no, we have to start future now, here and now. For instance, if you take a look at the Baltic states, they have this rare Baltica project, which did not try to modernize and spend enormous funds on uh, refurbishing their obsolete pre-existing railway infrastructure. They just... Uh, hijacked it and, and now, now they are building up a new, very modern cutting edge railway line, which is the standard European goal, so not the, the Soviet style, and immediately will put 
those three Baltic states in the system of European Union transportation because it will connect Warsaw through the Baltic cities with Helsinki and uh, they tried, they found the solution how to overcome such challenge and uh, maybe it's a lesson to learn from them for us, uh, we for countries as well. Uh, if we try to um, build up a a new infrastructure, a high-speed railway infrastructure. We have to forget about our pre-existing uh, railway tracks and lines, but it, it will be very expensive now, but it will have man generate many benefits in time, in short terms. And uh, still, we can use our pre-existing infrastructure for regional uh, traffic because uh, we have you know different electricity power systems we have different uh, train man traffic management systems in in operation and uh, therefore at the border crossings we either have to use uh, those um, engines that can uh, circulate in, in more than one uh, electric, electric power system, or we have to change the engines, we have to change the train drivers, so that, because they, they don't have knowledge about the uh, traffic signs or the language of comments. So these are very, you know, uh, new, these are nuances, but very important when it comes to the smooth and rapid transportation of goods and, and persons. Speaking of geo-economics of such a project, what would be approximate cost of building such a sophisticated railroad link in our region between our four countries, which would bring us together. Approximate cost, but as an expert, perhaps you have some estimation. If you see the website of the Rea Baltica project, I seem to remember they say it's around five or six billion euros. And they they are building infrastructures from scratch. Mm -hmm. So and the distances are similar. The distances they? are similar, and this project is concentrates on only and exclusively connecting the capital cities of uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and and Estonia. Mm -hmm. So the Warsaw and the Helsinki mm -hmm. uh, projects are not included in this calculation. Oh, okay. But still, so still. still. If we double it or triple it. Yeah, you can double it, and I think we are there, but um, we will have, of course, many collateral projects. Uh, I don't know, a connection to Vienna, a connection to Prague, uh, because those are those capitals are not included. But still, um, the thing I want to stress is that on that website I mentioned, mm -hmm. there are calculations, estimated estimated calculations about the benefits and the profits mm -hmm. of, of such projects. And those are enormous in comparison to the costs. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, that's why we have to concentrate and focus on such huge projects. They always say that uh, uh, building up high-speed railway lines are the most expensive infrastructural investments yeah because you have to have the calculations to the full length of uh, of the project beforehand uh, but this project will bring opportunities of course and economic indeed prosperity. But what i want to say that when you build up motorways mm -hmm. normally you are building it up step by step you know you you just open another new section between two cities and uh, so small bits mm -hmm. that's why those calculations and those uh, sums you know at the, the the figures mm -hmm. are less and uh, and are more moderate but if you calculate the full investment cost of a of a full motorway uh, line then you will have even bigger numbers mm -hmm than for the railways. Uh, that's why I'm saying that you must not compare 
the two or you have when you do the comparison you have to keep that thing in mind and the same goes for for um, uh, airport development uh, and stuff like that so yeah these are very important things but the last thing i want to add to this point is that such projects are long-term projects and you know normally governments tend sure. to think in four years terms because democratic governments have short perspective yes and uh, you know they have to have a, a campaign a promise mm -hmm. we will build up this and that and they have to open at least one small bit during that term and then again they have to promise another bit uh, for the next election and it goes on and on and on but if another uh, party wins mm -hmm. and forms the government or a go governing coalition then maybe their priorities will be different and they see the protocol is finished they push for finishing it and they take full credit of course and, and sometimes <laughs> yes they will do the, this or they will say no it's very expensive let's close it uh -huh. and and uh, build up another thing or or give this money use this money to i don't know to uh, the development of the healthcare system or other populist uh, uh, methods but that's why it's important for such long-term and huge infrastructure projects important to have political stability mm -hmm. because otherwise it's impossible so from your perspective which is the most robust uh, initiative which brings us together is it Project 4 is it Tracy's initiative uh, or any other initiative which which helps us to uh, basically achieve some uh, cohesion in our thinking in the region Vision Grad 4 is very different from all other mm -hmm. uh, intergovernmental or international cooperations in our region because it builds on it builds upon medieval experiences mm -hmm. you know these states the kingdom of uh, czechia hungary and poland were more or less founded in the same era in the middle ages and uh, we witness the same things, the same cha um, uh, challenges, and uh, those decision makers, our kings in the Middle Ages, uh, realize that our region has to work together, the nations in our region has to work together in order to face the challenges. And uh, that's why the B4, when it was uh, of the Visegrad uh, the cooperation when it was refounded in 1990 or 1991, it gave a cultural aspect as well because it all already had a history. So I think Visegrad is also an identity shaping thing in our minds because because of the medieval experiences and also because of the fact that these countries were more or less part of the Austrian Empire at the same time, the south of Poland, obviously, and the Czech Republic and the Kingdom of Hungary together with Slovakia. And uh, that's why I'm saying that there is such a thing like Visegrad identity, even if you don't call it like this but we understand each other we know each other's uh the way how we think uh, we have uh, similar experiences when we travel abroad uh, and uh, that's why I, I think that even if uh, you see it's very common now mm -hmm. especially in the, in the united states and in the western part of europe to to check your dna heritage or something like this and they say that our region, in our region, people living in our region have very similar uh, DNA. So it's in our blood that we belong together. Mm -hmm. The 3 initiative is a different thing. It's very important and it's very practical in terms of public policies like build up infrastructures, 
and to resolve the challenges and the issues, the problems we are facing currently, especially in geopolitics. But these initiatives involves too many countries, too many different nations, languages, approaches, religions, um, histories to become an identity shaping thing. And that's why I'm saying. And the other things that the Central European Initiative, I think it, it lost its relevance in the 90s. And or at least when these countries joined the EU. And uh, it's more related to the relationship between our region and Italy. And the, the Central European uh, Free Trade Agreement is, again, it's not for us, but for those countries that are not part of the EU right now. So, but the thing that um, both the Visegrad cooperation and the, the Three Seas Initiative um, shares and has in common is the strong support for the um, European enlargement towards the Western Balkans and uh, Eastern European countries, because uh, this is the way how our geopolitical weight can be measured, measured and also can be uh, multiplied. So how Visegrad Group or Visegrad Group example can help countries from Western Balkans or Eastern Europe to follow our example? How can we help them to be more successful? First and foremost, by giving our example and by sharing our best, pra our best practices and experiences. You know, the Visegrad cooperation had the only and only one institutional element, which is the International Visegrad Fund in Bratislava, with a common budget. And based on this project that supports uh, small and medium sized enterprises, new projects, and stuff like that, uh, connecting that region education project, cultural projects, and stuff like that. Based on this, the six Western Balkan states launched their own fund, the Western Balkan Six Fund. And they have their own cooperation format. Uh, this uh, Western Balkan Six, the Zapadno Balkanska Shestorka, which is uh, exactly it functions exactly in the same format as the paper, so it's more like an informal meeting of the uh, decision makers of uh, those countries involved. So this is the, the most important thing, how we can have the European Union accession. Uh, the other thing is to bring investments there, investments in human capital, economic investments in the infrastructure as well, in the banking sector, in the media. Perhaps they with corruption as well. Yes, and to, to share our, our best practice, to, to build up relationships between education and institutions. That's how it goes. Because the, 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 the first task for Visegrad for countries uh, or Visegrad states back then was to build up a system of mutual trust between each other. And that's what's still missing uh, in, in the Western Balkans due to many, many reasons. So this is a bad thing. And also the interpersonal ties. We tend not to think much about it because it uh, does not fit into this, um, you know, um, realpolitik vision. But those uh, connections between the citizens of uh, neighboring countries are truly important. We, because, uh, and that's why we have to uh, emphasize that besides the um, Erasmus project, for instance, uh, we have 
to support those youth exchange programs that are concentrated on our, reg our region. Because uh, when you're 30 or above, it's maybe it's already late to learn uh, about other nations and other countries. You have to uh, gather your knowledge when you are in the age of uh, absorbing such things, sure. when you are young, when you are a teenager or in your 20s. Because those ties, those connections, those personal ties will remain. Surely we need to find a way to appeal to ordinary people to be more curious about our region. The question is how do we do it? Because if people from Poland, people from Hungary, people from Slovakia, Czech Republic or uh, Bulgaria uh, choose to visit our region more often than going to you know, Rome, Paris, Berlin, this would also have an economic impact on our society, positive impact. So infrastructure is crucial. So yes, I agree that Polish people these days see infrastructure through the military perspective. Uh, but honestly speaking, it's also about the growth because the situation in Ukraine unfolded simply because the state was weak, corrupted, and uh, from my perspective, and thanks to Russian uh, imperialist uh, policies, uh, Russia would not attack strong countries, weaker countries for grabs, perhaps, from this perspective. But let's not talk about geopolitics too much. Uh, from this perspective, what I want to touch upon is Brexit. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, how this Brexit, how it unfolded, the whole saga uh, about Brexit, how it impacted our relationship between Western and Eastern Europe, Southern and Northern? How did it impact? Because from my perspective, we did not learn lessons about Brexit. The, My uh, observation is that Brussels just moved on and is not willing to reform its bureaucratic procedures. And that's what lost uh, Brits in the first place. They could not stand the bureaucracy anymore. The dealing with the uh, red state. And I don't think that in our region, Central European and Eastern Europe, uh, we have much patience, patience for bureaucracy. We want to get things done now, straight away. We don't like to wait for things. Do you share this observation? Yes, I think you are right in this, and uh, but I would like to put it in a different way. Brexit, mm -hmm. in my opinion, uh, showed the crisis of modern democracy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, and the role of the media mm -hmm. and the media itself. It's not the fourth pillar of power anymore. It's mm -hmm. the first and foremost. Okay, yeah. I agree. So if you want to, uh, as a prime minister, you want to attract more votes, mm -hmm. you offer the choice to the people to choose between you know, staying in the EU or leaving the EU. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter anymore that you say, I'm for I'm standing for staying with the EU, but I give you the chance to choose. You already let the spirit out of uh, yeah. the the the, uh, the genes out of the bottle. Yeah. That that's the thing. So again, we had to realize that um, this kind of uh, populistic uh, com political communication mm -hmm. has become a very dangerous weapon in these things, because the uh, 21st century, they say the 21st century started in uh, 2001 mm -hmm. with the terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. But I think it really started with the rise of uh, this new internet-based political communication. Mm -hmm. The other thing that Brexit showed mm -hmm. was the crisis of the European Union, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Because imagine when 
they had a referendum in the United Kingdom in the 70s on whether to join the European communities or not, mm -hmm. economic uh, community or not. People opted for joining uh, the European community. And exactly that generation who were young in the 70s and wanted to join the European community, now as older and uh, allegedly more wise or supposedly more wise and experienced generation opted for leaving the same European um, community. Why? Because it's not the same anymore. Uh, for them, you know, everyone has to blame um, a bigger power for the uh, unfortunate happenings in their lives. And uh, I think this Brexit showed exactly uh, this, how uh, British people were blaming the EU for the vicissitudes, uh, for their um, economic difficulties, and for the threats that um, that very liberal migration policies caused or um, supposedly caused for them. And uh, it was about that. And it also showed the third thing, the third and last I want to uh, add to this. Brexit also showed the generational gap uh, in, in the how to perceive politics and political happenings. If you, uh, that each generation and each individual lived in its, in, in their own bubble, and it really depends on what sources of news you are reading, what uh, catches your attention, and you will uh, build your own world uh, with these bricks of information and younger generations they grew up in this very multi multicultural circumstance uh, they participated in um, youth exchange programs uh, just like us they worked with colleagues from all over all around the world other generations, they did not have such experiences. They they cannot even uh, imagine how how it goes and how it functions, and uh, they have different kinds of experiences. That's why what is an opportunity for us might be perceived as a threat for them. And Brexit showed this. And uh, just to conclude this thing uh, with a penalty, with a, with a, with the last very very last. Uh, remark when we Hungary and the centuries European countries joined the EU in 2004 there were huge celebrations everywhere in each city uh, fireworks and I used to be a clarinet player mm -hmm. a huge orchestra of 200 musicians mm -hmm. uh, and when we, we were playing the fireworks suite during the the fireworks in Opener Square, and when we were learning our bits individually, my clarinet teacher said that uh, imagine um, remember this experience very well, because next time you will play this mm -hmm. will be when we leave the EU. <laughs> so he even beforehand was very skeptical about the European Union. He was. <laughs> He actually predicted the Brexit like that. Well, surely our generation voted for joining the European Union because it was predominantly in favor. The project was incredible back then. Um, I'm not sure whether the federalist policies of the certain politicians or certain parties are appealing to all of the people from our generation. Uh, but possibly our generation in 30, 40 years will have different opinion about the European Union altogether. But, well, hopefully, on the other hand, we will not share this experience, the British experience, and we will build 
on our collaborations, cooperations, uh, bring it to different levels. You never know. It's it's interesting. From your perspective, uh, what is Hungarian role in shaping the EU voice towards global powers? Well, we have very limited mm -hmm. uh, room of manoeuvre here due to our economic potential, demographic mm -hmm. uh, attributes, and our position. That's why the only thing we can rely on is the unanimous voting mm -hmm. when each uh, country leader has one vote and has a say in what's going on and what will happen in the European Union or in the NATO. Otherwise, Hungary is a very, very old country. It was one of the five first Christian kingdoms to be founded, but we had no colonies. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we don't have that background that, for instance, uh, the United Kingdom could uh, rely on when they uh, yeah. left the EU. So they said that the Commonwealth and that system mm -hmm. would uh, not replace, but in a way would be an option. Hungary and our nation is in Central Europe. We don't have such option. So, but we can use our uh, historical in experience and our geopolitical position between the East and the West, because uh, we can be act like a, a bridge. In Hungarian literature and philosophy, there is a school of thought to consider that Hungary is a bridge between the East and the West, and, an, and another school of thought uh, perceives our nation as a ferry, mm -hmm. not a bridge. And it's a huge difference because a ferry mm -hmm. is one time at one side, another time at the other side. That makes sense. But a bridge, it's always there in one, mm -hmm. one place. It's firm and it does not really belong to any of the two sides, but connects them. Mm -hmm. It's very different and I'm sure in Poland and Czechia and these countries is the same. They think about themselves in a, in a very similar way. But we Hungarians, we have a, a special um, power, let's say, in this way, that our nation, um, more than a millennia, came from Central Asia, mm -hmm. which gives us uh, special connections to, for instance, Turkic nations. Mm -hmm. um, in Turkey, they perceive us as a distant relative, even if language-wise we are not, mm -hmm. uh, we don't belong to the same family, even if we had uh, more than thousand common words. But still, uh, in history, we fought many battles against each other. Yeah. But still, they perceive us as a distant relative, those Hungarians. But it gives us a, a huge potential in, in diplomacy. So that's the way how Hungary can use its power uh, or its uh, position. The other thing is, you know, when the biggest tragedy that ever happened to Hungary was after the First World War, when uh, there were no military actions within our territory at all. Mm -hmm. And our groups were winning their battles abroad. Still, we finished as a loser of the war. Uh, and uh, we lost two thirds of our territories and one third of our uh, ethnic Hungarian population, which is a trauma that even after a century, it's a generational trauma because each family has this. Myself, the, my great grandfather was originally from Transylvania, mm -hmm. and the, each family, you know, we have these connections. It's a huge trauma because, uh, even if, of course, we are proud of the new nations that were brought, born in the ruins of our yeah. kingdom, and we are happy for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always take a look at Slovakia, it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. 
not the political crisis now, but as a nation, how it's existing and uh, uh, joined the Eurozone, for instance. <clears throat> but uh, what I want to say that uh, this sense of injustice is tremendous. But what we used after this tragedy happened between the two world wars mm -hmm. was uh, education and knowledge. Because back then, our politicians and the uh, Minister of Education and uh, Religion, he said, Religious Affairs, he said that, okay, Hungary lost its, its uh, regional uh, power role, lost all of its natural resources, mm -hmm. almost, lost many, many uh, millions of citizens, but still can act as a cultural hub or center in Central East Europe and must use this, must use their old universities, uh, must use the, its experience, its uh, huge literature and, uh, and, um, and all the achievements it, it, uh, it gained throughout the centuries. And I think this is the only thing we can participate. Yes. Take a look at the Nobel Prize uh, winners. Uh, as a, for a, such a small nation, uh, we had the um, luck to, to, to give the world many Nobel Prize winners and they for science. But if you uh, think of the sports, the Olympics, again, we can say that uh, we are lucky to, to, to I always, our I always support your swimmers because they are so good in Olympics. Yes, the yeah. water sports. Water, water sports, sports are just incredible. Uh, but just like in the Balkans, if yeah. you go there, so in, in the Western Balkan states, uh, they are our own enemies, actually, in, in water polo, for instance. So this is the way how we can participate. And um, the other thing is that we have um, Political, a generation of uh, decision makers, political de decision makers, who were who started their careers during the regime changes, mm -hmm. so they experienced a lot in these three decades. They actually participated in in uh, sending the Soviet troops mm -hmm. back to to the Soviet Union to Russia. So they were they can be perceived as. Uh, you know, freedom fighters in, in this sense, because they brought us this Western democracy and stuff. They built a, built a Western type of democracy here in Hungary. And now, as they are getting old, with their experience, they want to uh, participate in European politics more. Mm -hmm. Hungary is it's not enough anymore for them. They are... Uh, way to bigger players. Take a look at the map and uh, the demographics. Hungary is now even, uh, our population is even less than 10 million people. Mm -hmm. Still, uh, it, now it doesn't matter in what context, but our prime minister mm -hmm. is everywhere in the newspapers, in the news, throughout the world, throughout the Western world. Everyone knows about him. Primarily before uh, Mr. Viktor Orban, it was our great football players, Puskas, who, who was the most famous Hungarian uh -huh. from the 20th century. But now it's not him anymore. Everyone knows about uh, Viktor Orban, and it doesn't matter in what, what context, but he became our, our uh, you know, national symbol in a way, and his generation and his fellow politicians they are playing a very important role, for instance, in um, being a liaison between the new Italian government and the Polish government and stuff like this. That's why I say that this is an experience we can use, but otherwise, obviously, we, had, we have limited resources. I think the history of Hungary is similar to the history of Poland when it comes to losing some lands from the um, overcoming our historical difficulties. So for many of us, we can sympathize and we can find a way to understand each other because of our historical experience and because of our 
ideas about the future and the function for cooperation in general. From your perspective, uh, what's future holds for the region? How how can we make it stronger? How can we turn this region into the EU's powerhouse? Well, I think um, it's a it's a more like it sounds like a political promise or a communication to become EU's power. I don't think this is the future for our region. Mm -hmm. Our most important task to do is to move from the periphery or the semi-periphery of Europe to the center. Of course, not physically, but <laughs> virtually. And uh, geography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, that's the place where we, where we belong. In terms of economy, in terms of politics, in terms of uh, culture, heritage, and history, as and uh, we have to use our potential, which is uh, good education, talented young people, and uh, this sense of uh, belonging. Because in life, in one's life, it's very important to have a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging. And now, if we have the sense of belonging that we belong to the same region we have, we face the same challenges and uh, we are from the same, let's say, family, then we will easily find our purpose and we will have this. Because uh, back then, before we joined the EU in the 90s, that was our purpose, obviously. But once we achieved that goal, uh, it's very, and the NATO accession as well, it's very, um, it's all, we have always changing purposes, always changing aims and goals, and that's why it's uh, difficult to stay together. This is the most important thing. How can we become is... Uh, the, the, how can we move closer to the center of European uh, decision making or, or when, where, where the, center, the core of Europe is to build up a more resilient region with the help of the V4 cooperation, the three C's initiatives or any other kind of region. Uh, initiatives because we have to bring resources to the region and we have to use them well for our own benefit. We have to build up a, a region that is as self-sustainable as possible. And uh, we have to use our potential to reshape our region, not to be a wall between East and West anymore, but the bridge, as I mentioned. So, from your professional opinion, what future holds for countries like Peru, Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Western Balkan countries, Bosnia, Kosovo, Serbia, all of these countries which are not in the Southern Balkan uh, Union, uh, and in the meantime, they're at the axis of Russia, for example. Can we find a way to? bring them together to, to our organizations and start collaborating with them in the broader sense and basically uh, make sure that neither Moscow nor Washington are dictating what future holds for them. Can we be a factor in this? Currently, I don't think that uh, it's an option for Europe to decide on the future of Central and Central European countries and uh, Western Balkans nations. Think of the uh, Yugoslav independence war mm -hmm. wars in the 90s. Europe in its own was unable to stop the fight, stop the bloodshed, was unable to make peace there without the help of the US, mm -hmm. without the uh, interference of uh, Turkey and Gulf states and Russia. We could not solve this 
uh, problem on our own. Europe, economy-wise, it's a big power, but in terms of political power, it does not exist. When there was political stability in Germany, they were able to convince other European Union partners to uh, partake in their in achieving their goals. But now it's a different situation. Uh, we have France, we have Germany, we have Italy. Uh, but obviously they are all NATO countries, but with a slightly differing um, interests mm -hmm. in the world and with different uh, ties to, for instance, China, with different per perceptions towards Russia. So that's what I say that when uh, the Western world and NATO countries were able to build up a relationship, uh, a normal, normalized relationship with uh, uh, Moscow was when they were able to act in partnership with each other. And of course, we have to admit that uh, now the, the future of the world is not being written in our region. It's, it's more about uh, the Pacific, it's more about the Far East. What we can do with these countries you mentioned Actually, nothing. They have to decide mm -hmm. on their future. And if they agreed upon one goal, our only task is to support them in that goal. But if it's only a, a political communication, for instance, for Ukraine to join the NATO, uh, then we have to perceive it like this and uh, it's always best to think what is the best for the people of Ukraine, the people of Moldova, the people of Belarus and the countries in the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans is a different thing because it's already surrounded with by EU and NATO countries. So it's another thing. Uh, I think it's beyond any doubt, beyond any question that we, the that region has to join the European communities in one way or another. We have to find a solution for that because it's in our best interest, not just in Hungary's interest because we are neighboring with this region, but the best interest of the whole of Europe, the whole of the European Union to uh, rule out any threats that might arise from that region. Those countries that are between uh, Russia and uh, NATO is a different thing because uh, our best choice is uh, for a long run is not to have enemies anymore it is to uh, think what is best for Russian people Ukrainian people and uh, and uh, those people living there no regime is eternal. We, we have seen this, we've seen it in, in our history. Each regime has an end, has to come to an end, and that's why um, I think it's always misleading if we simplify um, the questions, the equation only to one player. It's, uh, we always say in media that this war in Ukraine, this aggression, military things war. But is it really? I mean, we don't know the uh, his advisors, his system, his government, how it functions, what information he gathers and he gets, and what are the political motivations. We don't know exactly the relationship between uh, the deep state, the Ukrainian deep state, and the Russian deep state. 
we what we do know is that people of Ukraine is suffering this war. And um, I think the best choice for us is to support the uh, intentions of the Ukrainian government that will lead to the end of the suffering of, of uh, Ukrainian people and the bloodshed there. And if it's NATO accession, then we have to support that. If it's EU accession, then we have to support that because our main reason and it has to be to save Ukraine and Ukrainian people. Uh, I'm saying peoples because, of course, Ukraine is a huge and very, very big country with a lot of ethnic minorities, uh, Romanians, Polish people, Bulgarians even, and Russian people, of course, and, Hungarians. Hungarians, and of course, Hungarians. Uh, unfortunately, uh, every time less and less because uh, they are living in a very deprived, underdeveloped region in Ukraine. And uh, it's always easier for them to come to Hungary, especially now that they uh, took their already existing rights to learn in Hungarian language at schools. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's a difficult question. And I think we have to find a solution. And we have a good history to build upon. I mean, Hungary was the second or one of the first countries to uh, re recognize the independence of uh, Ukraine. And I think Poland was the first, perhaps. Yeah, the second maybe, to... maybe. Or after Germany, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important. But we, um, um, we had our first uh, neighborly relation um, contract or memorandum with, with Ukraine after the regime changes. And uh, it's very important for us in terms of international trade, in terms of our minorities. I mean, even in Hungary, even before the war, there were many workers, Ukrainian workers, especially in the, in the construction industry. So yes, it's, it's, it's uh, the best way is to, to support these connections that, that bind us together. Because uh, if you go there, if you go to Ukraine, you will see a beautiful country with full of potential, Definitely. but with huge poverty. I mean, this is the poorest country in, in Europe. Maybe Moldova is the poorest, I'm not sure. Well, I think after the war now, it will be the first war, the poorest country. And these neighboring EU countries are the best and in the best position to go there and have them rebuild their infrastructure, to rebuild their schools, their hospitals. We are yes. already doing this. Mm -hmm. Hungary, Poland, we are already started our partnership even before the war started. Uh, the Hungarian state budget supported that uh, Zakarpatia region, they call it the region where Hungarians live, I think Hungarians live in Ukraine, more than the Kiev, more than the Kiev budget, central budget. Imagine two thirds of the investment to that Ukrainian region went from Budapest and not from Kiev. So we, of course we have to support uh, that region because it's, uh, they, we are neighbors and uh, we have to we have to um, find our future and there is a lot there is a huge potential to, to build thank you much for this question answers to my questions it's been a real pleasure i wish you best of luck with you in your endeavors and i hope that the next time we will see more let's say, peaceful uh, surroundings in a way, in the global sense, basically. Hopefully, next time we meet, the war in Ukraine will be over. Fingers crossed. I, I hope to meet you next week or next month. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but uh, I hope that our collaboration will continue in the years and decades. Me too. The pleasure was all mine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this interview. 
Um, and thank you very much uh, uh, for organizing this, for coming to Budapest. And yeah, me too. I hope that uh, maybe next time we will have such a uh, thought-provoking um, conversation who knows in Kiev with our Ukrainian Hopefully. and Russian friends together. Hopefully, yes. Let's and bring everyone together. Let's talk about peace. And yes, because uh, prosperity, that, development, and about future collaboration. And about, yes, the things that connect us. And uh, good luck to you as well to your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.